started. Um, we currently have 64 attendees, but I know that we'll have more people joining us. Um, and so I'd like to take a second to just introduce everyone on the panel. Um, I am Michelle Fitzgibbon. I'm the executive director for the Ohio Fire Chiefs Association. And um, we are pleased to have um, Dr. Carol Cunningham. She's the state medical director. Dr. Eric Cortez, um, he's serving as the medical director for OFCA. Um, and they'll be um, just walking through some information about vaccinations. And then we also have um, Deputy Director Lance Himes, uh, Bobby Craybill, and Meredith Cameron with the Department of Health. And so they will um, be sharing some additional information and then we'll um, go into Q&A. And for Q&A, um, you can either write that into um, the uh, Q&A chat uh, feature at the bottom, or if you want to um, raise your hand, um, I can have you um, answer your, ask your question directly um, to the panelists. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Cortez. I think he's gonna start um, and um, lead this presentation. And just so everyone knows, we are recording this and we will put it on our YouTube channel. So um, we'll make sure to share it with those who were unable to attend today and you can share it as well. So Dr. Cortez, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you everyone for uh, joining us this morning to discuss the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, as Michelle said, I serve as the medical director for the Ohio Fire Chiefs Association. Our plan for this morning is I'm gonna go through some background information on vaccines. I'll briefly touch on the scientific literature that we have on the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. Then I'll hand it over to Dr. Cunningham to discuss her work at a national level and with the state and to obtain her perspective. And we have, we have several panelists here that have uh, a lot of expertise that we would like to share. And then we'll have plenty of times for questions and answers as well. So I wanna start briefly and just talk about why we vaccinate and the reason why we vaccinate, I think, can, can be broken down into three items. Number one, we vaccinate to prevent infections. Um, an example of this would be a hepatitis B vaccine where we obtain a series of vaccines and we can help prevent infection later on in life. A second goal of vaccine programs is to decrease disease. And this can be disease severity, duration, or even complications from the disease. And a common example of this would be the flu vaccine where we are able to decrease complications and duration of illness. And a third goal is to achieve herd immunity. And we hear this mentioned a lot over the past few weeks in regards to COVID, but herd immunity is important. On the right-hand side of your screen, is just an example of what can be achieved with a successful vaccination program. This is an example of the measles vaccine. And you can see in the 50s and 60s, we had a very high amount of measles cases. And then over the course of several years, we introduced the measles vaccine. And we essentially brought that down to zero for several years, achieving herd immunity. So I think it's important to keep these broad principles in mind as we talk about the COVID-19 vaccine and what our goals are for, for, our, um, for our vaccine program. The second question I wanna address is how do vaccines work? On the top of your screen here are, are, are three common infections, measles, chicken pox, and the flu. And any kind of pathogen, whether it's a virus or bacteria, is gonna have surface proteins. And these surface proteins represented as a triangle, a semicircle, or a rectangle on this diagram, these serve as antigens. Antigens are recognized by our, our immune system, and our immune system recognizes these antigens as something that the body does not produce. And the result of that through a very complex mechanism is our bodies create antibodies to these specific pathogens, essentially providing immunity to these diseases moving forward. The challenge is when we have a new pathogen or a novel coronavirus, and the example in this diagram is, is the green uh, pathogen, we have a new pathogen and we have new antigens that our body does not recognize. So we don't have any natural formed antibodies to help fight that infection. So how do vaccines work? Well, through a variety of mechanisms, we can find these antigens or these surface proteins. Go to the bottom of your screen. And uh, for the most part, we're introducing these antigens to the body and we're inducing the, the host immune system to create antibodies. And then antibodies achieve those three goals that we just talked about. With the COVID-19 vaccine, you probably have heard a lot about 
messenger RNA technology. I don't want to get much into the biochemistry behind this, but essentially the messenger RNA is, is being used to form these antigens to the SARS virus. And then our, our bodies are creating those antibodies uh, to the surface proteins. So with that background information in mind, let's just briefly overview the scientific literature that we have currently on the vaccines. And a lot of those papers got a lot of attention in regards to adverse effects of the vaccine. So I think it's important to group adverse effects into these three categories. And um, there can be more, there can be different categories, but this is a nice uh, straightforward way and, and from my perspective to group the potential adverse effects. Number one, we have allergic reactions. And as EMS providers, as first responders, as pre-hospital personnel, we always deal with this. Sometimes these can be mild allergic reactions, or sometimes they can be systemic and severe, such as anaphylaxis. These can be due to the vaccine or the substances that the vaccine is, is made with or stored with. Secondly, we have immunogenic reactions. And what this means is when our immune system recognizes the vaccine, our immune system kicks in the gear. And when that happens, we can have systemic signs and symptoms that we typically get with a true infection. So we can have headache, fatigue, muscle aches, body aches, general malaise. And typically that's just the immune system recognizing the vaccine and creating antibodies to that. And those are just side effects of our immune system working. And those are to be expected with vaccines. And then thirdly, we hear a lot about low frequency serious adverse events such as you know, Bell's palsy or uh, severe hypersensitivity reactions. And these can happen it's important to, I think, when we talk about the low frequency serious events, compare that to what the incidence is in the general population and even in individuals that have not received the vaccine. So keep these three things in mind as we go through the, the two scientific papers that are out. And we'll start with the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, this was a large uh, randomized uh, trial. They compared people that got the vaccine with people that got placebo. And the two main conclusions from this study, number one, there was 95% efficacy against COVID-19. Out of, out of uh, tens of thousands of people, pe people that got the vaccine, only eight cases of COVID-19 were found compared to 162 cases in individuals that received the placebo. So that, is, that met the threshold for efficacy in regards to the Pfizer vaccine. The safety over the two months of study was similar to other viral vaccines. There was injection site pain, fatigue, headache. Again, those typical mild immunogenic reactions that we expect. And there were some serious adverse events, but it was low and it was consistent uh, between the vaccine and the placebo group. So these low frequency critical events were, were likely gonna happen regardless of whether the vaccine was received or not. Now the Moderna vaccine, we don't have a scientific paper. The Pfizer vaccine was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is from the FDA report from a few weeks ago. Two main conclusions. Number one, the benefits of the vaccine outweigh the risk. Again, you compare 11 cases versus 185 cases uh, in vaccine versus placebo. And that met the threshold for efficacy for the Moderna vaccine. Uh, there was also the conclusion that the Moderna vaccine had a favorable safety profile. And you can see, again, a lot of individuals had injection site pain, headache, fatigue, muscle and joint aches. That's to be expected. There was some lymphadenopathy in both groups as well. Again, so that's related to the immunogenic reaction. Uh, some individuals had hypersensitivity reactions, so the allergic reactions, the anaphylaxis, but there were some in each case, 1.5% in the vaccine group versus 1% in the placebo group. And we hear a lot about Bell's palsy too. And um, these cases happened three in the vaccine group and one in the placebo group. And there's, there's really not a way to know if these are correlated or not. They, they, they occurred in both groups, but we don't know if the vaccine actually calls the Bell's palsy. Uh, but overall, taking that into effect, the safety profile was very favorable for the Moderna vaccine. So putting all that together, we, we have data on the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine for COVID-19. We know about our goals of a vaccine program and we know how they work. 
At this point, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Cunningham to elaborate on uh, her perspective on the COVID-19 vaccines, as well as offer her perspective from her national and uh, state work. Thank you, Dr. Cunningham. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cortez. Um, what I would like to touch on is um, the fact that, number one, there are some facts we know. We know that um, EMS providers, frontline workers have fallen ill and have died from this disease. Um, I'm sure most people on the call have been impacted from a staffing standpoint uh, due to COVID. Um, you know, the other big challenge with this, with this disease is that there's an asymptomatic carrier state, so someone can have it and spread it to many others uh, without having any symptoms at all. So I, you know, the vaccine is, is, is great that it's here. Um, I think we have to do a lot of work to uh, promote it, as well as to allay some fears that people have about the vaccine. Uh, first and foremost, um, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines are created out of messenger RNA. There is no COVID vaccine particles or pieces and parts in the vaccine. It's a man-made um, protein. M mRNA actually in exists in all of, our, all of our bodies on a microscopic level. So unlike previous vaccines like influenza, there's no virus in the vaccine itself. Um, from my work with uh, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, um, NHTSA's Office of EMS, as well as the National Association of State EMS Officials, um, we've been polling some people, and not only just uh, first responders, but just the general public, as to what are their, what's keeping them from getting the vaccine. You know, part of it is our culture in America. Everybody thinks a, a pill will fix something if you get sick. Um, it's not so serious as long as there's a treatment. So, you know, now we have remdesivir and monoclonal antibodies that are available for people who actually become ill from COVID-19. But I think most people don't realize that number one, um, it's only for a select eligible group of patients. And number two, not everybody who receives those medications survive. We hear about the survivors on TV but there are people who still receive these medications who die. Um, and then the other thing is I think people focus in on the acute symptoms, um, you know, the respiratory problems, the fever, the cough. Um, we are still learning a lot about the disease. There are long-term effects in survivors that we are seeing. Uh, chronic fatigue, headache, persistent shortness of breath that never goes away. So I think when you're talking to um, a frontline worker who, particularly those who are very early in their career, uh, you know, we were all young and invincible. You know, we didn't think we were going to get sick. You know, I grew up before bicycle helmets came around and, you know, I, I still made it. But um, I, would, I would caution folks, this is not a bacteria, it's a virus. So um, viruses can stay in your body for a long time. Um, and I think if you were given the choice of getting vaccinated to prevent a disease rather than getting, a, getting the disease and having to live with it for the rest of your life, it's side effects, you would get the vaccine. I would say, you know, compare it to HIV. You know, people were dying of HIV, now we have antiviral agents, but wouldn't you prefer not to have that disease? Herpes, same thing. And if you want to talk about something that's not a virus, let's look at what happened at, after 9-11. Uh, we saw some people with respiratory illnesses, but decades later, we're seeing people who are dying of cancer from the chemical exposure. Again, because this is the first, that was the first time that type of incident had ever happened. So I suspect that as we go through uh, COVID, we'll be seeing more side effects long-term and people maybe even being so debilitated that they can no longer work um, based upon this virus, on having the virus that again is so preventable with the vaccine. And then um, the other thing I would wanna to mention too, we are so fortunate to, as uh, EMS providers to be in phase 1A, healthcare workers phase 1A, frontline workers phase 1A. The one thing that we cannot control is uh, the supplier from the, supply from the manufacturer. We already know that the, the demand already is, exceeds the supply. 
And as the phases open up to more populations, I can only predict that this will increase. Um, and again, we don't know how quickly these manufacturers will be able to keep up with that increased need. Um, in terms of uh, support for you, as well as education, uh, EMS providers are able to give vaccines. We encourage you to work with your public health agencies to assist them in the mass vaccination campaign, as well as to get your own providers vaccinated. Uh, if you go to the Division of EMS website, um, there are two training modules that are posted, one for the Pfizer vaccine and one for the Moderna vaccine that will give you lots of information, not only about the vaccine, but also on how to administer it. Um, each vaccine has to be prepared a different way. And it also explains the extra paperwork that is required. Both of these vaccines were um, released safely and, and demonstrated to be effective, but they were released under the Emergency Use, um, at, uh, use Authorization, the EUA. And there is mandatory reporting, again, for data collection that has to be done. So I will go ahead and open it up to the next speaker. Um, Eric and I are certainly open for any questions that you may have. Thank you. Well, thanks, Dr. Cunningham and Dr. Cortez. And, and thank you, Michelle, for having us on um, the call today. I'm Lance Himes. I'm the senior deputy at the Ohio Department of Health. <clears throat> and just wanted to share a few things um, with you. I know many of you have already started working with your local health departments um, in partnership um, as Dr. Cunningham mentioned um, EMS and, and first responders are in phase 1A, which includes high risk healthcare workers and long term care residents and staff, um, and some other congregate care uh, residents and staff. Um, <clears throat> but importantly, we wanted to make sure our healthcare workers were protected. So you can, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, like on the airplane when they say put your mask on first, and then you can assist. Um, your loved one or your child, that's kind of the same concept here. Um, but we wanted to make sure you guys had access to the vaccine and working with our local health departments. That is the primary mode of distribution to EMS workers. And <clears throat> I know many clinics have already begun. Many of our local health departments have had clinics um, starting last week over the weekend. I know uh, Dayton, Montgomery, Public Health, Franklin County, just to name a few, have had um, clinics for EMS providers. I know Hamilton County is working closely with their providers. So if you have not been um, reached out to from your local health department yet, I would encourage you um, to reach out to your public local health department and talk about getting vaccinated. And they can set up a, a clinic for your um, team to get vaccinated. It's very important um, that you proceed um, as quickly as you can because um, as Dr. Cunningham mentioned, you're in phase 1A now and we have um, allocated doses to our local health departments and to our hospitals to cover kind of a defined population of healthcare workers. We anticipate that phase 1A may be somewhere between a million to uh, 1.3 million total Ohioans that includes some of our long-term care residents and staff, but it also includes our um, high-risk healthcare workers. So after phase 1A, once we get through um, a significant portion and we're moving very quickly um, through that phase, we will be shifting vaccine supplies to other populations. And Governor DeWine announced last week that we will be focusing in phase 1B on Ohioans age 65 and older. We know that 87% of our mortality um, related to COVID has occurred in age uh, 65 and up. So that is important that we uh, allow for them to be vaccinated um, so we can reduce mortality. In addition, we are focusing on our education K through 12 sector. Um, the governor set a goal that all schools can be back in person uh, by March 1st. Many schools have used a hybrid approach or a remote approach. Some have been in, in, in full um, during the, the pandemic, but allowing educators to get vaccinated is also another tool to get our kids back in school. Finally, we're in, in the 1B population going to be shifting to um, in individuals with congenital or inherited um, critical health issues, 
things like Down syndrome, spina bifida, sickle cell, there's a defined list of those um, particular populations who are very high risk um, for negative consequences related to COVID. So I, I say all that just to encourage you um, to evaluate the information, look at the training materials um, that Dr. Cortez and Dr. Cunningham talked about um, in order to make an educated decision on whether the vaccine is right for you. Um, we certainly support the use and safety of the vaccine. Um, the studies have been very good, very low, if any side effects, uh, adverse events. We've not seen very many at all since we've started um, administering in Ohio. Um, those events are reported through a federal adverse event reporting system. So we're tracking that. Um, but I want just to make sure that you understand the timing. Um, right now, it's a perfect time for you all to, to get, get vaccinated. Um, as we shift to this other population 1B, um, we may not have vaccine allocated for these particular purposes. So really want you to take advantage of, of that time frame. Um, two other quick things. Um, the other piece is I know many of you, um, as Dr. Cunningham mentioned too, are, are able to give the vaccine. And we would certainly encourage you to, um, if you can partner with your local health departments or other local partners uh, to participate um, in clinics um, to provide vaccine to other populations um, and even other EMTs or um, EMS first responders. Um, certainly the increased staffing, if, if possible, will help get the vaccine out quicker. Um, so we would encourage those partnerships if at all possible. And then um, finally, I wanna touch a little bit on, um, we've been enrolling providers in Ohio and that's to ensure that the providers have the proper uh, training, proper storage capacity, um, and the proper licensure and credentials to administer the vaccines. Um, while many of you, again, have you know, individual credentials that would allow you to uh, put a shot in an arm, um, I don't know that all of your departments have <clears throat> the storage, the freezer capacity, things like that set up. So right now, currently, we're not um, recommending that local health departments transfer, you know, 100 doses to a department for you to utilize um, separately from the health department doing the actual clinic themselves. I know that might be happening in some communities. Um, certainly, we understand it from an efficiency standpoint, but we want to just ensure that we're reducing any risk that any vaccine is wasted. Um, and we want to make sure that it's, you know, mixed, diluted properly and administered properly. So currently that's where we do have a restriction. Um, but if it was a transfer from one, <clears throat> excuse me, one enrolled provider to an, another enrolled provider, that would be permissible. Um, and then we just want to make sure we get those doses reported uh, back into the system so we can track them. Um, but with that, I'll turn it back to the team and thanks for having us on um, and happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. And we do have a few questions. Um, first, um, Dr. Cortez, um, are you able to send us your slides so we can push them out to the attendees? We have a couple of people that requested them. Yeah, that's no problem. Okay, and then another question we had is, um, does the new strain affect the vaccination process? And I don't know if anyone's prepared to answer that, um, but if you have any insight. It, I can, oh, go ahead, Dr. Cunningham. I was going to say it certainly uh, doesn't change um, or the urgency or need for us to get vaccinated. Um, at this point, we don't know. It was just discovered this week, um, but I'm sure that the CDC and the uh, will be following that pretty closely. The only thing they've come out and said is that they feel that it's highly contagious, but then so is the, the current strain. Um, for Lance, uh, locally, we've seen less vaccine delivered than anticipated. Will this continue, or do you see the delivery numbers increasing to the local health departments in the near future? Great question. Um, so we did um, receive a little bit less um, than we expected in terms of the Moderna shipment. I think we had received estimates of about 89,000 in the most recent shipment that that went out this week, but we actually got 69,700. Um, HHS has kind of smoothed out that process. So we are using um, for a planning assumption, 
approximately 70,000 doses um, each of Moderna and Pfizer. Right now, the Pfizer vaccine is being allocated to this long-term care federal pharmacy program, but the Moderna we're distributing to um, local health departments and hospitals. Um, so I think our numbers for this week that are available to ship next week are right around 69,700 again. Um, so there is limited supply, and that's why I would encourage you to, to partner and to, to uptake if you're interested in that. Again, it's not mandatory from a statewide perspective that anyone take it, um, but there are limited supplies. So we're working with our local health departments to make sure they use what they have and that we can shift that around if necessary, if others have gotten through their um, initial supply and need more. So limited supplies for sure, um, but we're hopeful that as um, manufacturing ramps up, um, and I think the new administration has talked about um, potentially using the Defense Production Act to ensure um, pieces and parts of the vaccine um, supplies are manufactured in, in a way that supports that production. There's also a, a few other vaccine products that are in um, the clinical review process. So the AstraZeneca vaccine and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, hopefully um, when those vaccines get um, FDA emergency use authorization approval, um, that we would be able to start utilizing those too. But currently we do have limited supply. Um. So going on the limited supply, should providers wait to receive a vaccine if they've had COVID within the last three to four months due to the volume of vaccine availability and that the provider has antibodies for three to four months? Um, from the research that I've read uh, or has been presented to me, uh, for those folks who have recovered from COVID as well as those who have received the monoclonal antibody, um, uh, the recommend, most of the recommendations that I've seen have stated that those people should defer receiving the vaccine for uh, 90 days. Um, you know, the, they want to make sure that the vaccine is going to be able to mount a, a, a decent response and someone who's recently recovered has a large amount of antibodies already. So kind of piggybacking on that question, um, one of the things that we're hearing um, from people is, you know, some people don't want to be part of like 1A, they maybe want to wait a little bit, but if you are 1A and you choose not to get vaccinated, and Lance, I think you talked about this a little bit, but, you know, if, if you decide to wait and then you move on to like 1B or you're in 2 or wherever, and then somebody from 1A wants to get back in line, um, have you talked about yet with the uh, you know, governor's office, like how that's gonna work? Will that person be able to get back in line or do they have to wait then? Yeah, that's a good, a good question. We, we haven't really defined how that process would work. I mean, certainly we will be shifting the supply to probably different providers and to focus on those different populations. However, um, you know, there's the second dose requirement in addition, uh, but I, I don't think that there'll be a formal way um, for 1A folks to jump back in line, but certainly as the populations expand, there could be other ways that you would qualify um, to be vaccinated. For example, if you're age 65 or older, um, or if, if we're expanding beyond that, um, we may lower the age um, if we're seeing good throughput, and there could be the potential that just by age qualification you would uh, qualify. So. Great question. We will follow up with our team on that um, because I would like to see that potential. Um, but really, we're trying to encourage folks to get vaccinated while they're they can as a group in an organized fashion. Okay. So, um, thank you. We appreciate that. And as we get the follow up on that, we'll push it out to the members as well. So. Um, another question, we're being told that even if someone is vaccinated, if they are a close contact expo exposure to a COVID positive patient, they will be subject to the same quarantine requirements as someone who's not vaccinated. However, we're also being told that if someone has been diagnosed and recovered from COVID-19 and are then a close contact exposure, they are not subject to a quarantine. Can you explain why the discrepancy? Um, first of all, someone who is um, 
if you, it, once you get vaccinated, it takes a while for your body to build up adequate antibodies. So um, even if you're vaccinated, they still want people to wear uh, face masks and, and exercise social distancing. Um, I'm not sure where the recommendation came for someone who recovered from COVID. Um, I would state that those, those folks still need to um, uh, exercise social distancing and, 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 and those kind of measures. Uh, we've actually seen a couple of cases in the, case, in the country where someone's gotten COVID twice. Um, the severity, I don't know. Um, it's something that they're, again, we're learning so much about this disease. Um, Lance, I don't know if you have heard anything um, more about that. Yeah, we, we would have to check with the CDC guidance on that. I'm sure they have that um, guidance that would cover that situation. Um, but unfortunately, Dr. Vanderhoff uh, couldn't be with us today. I think he's up on that. So we'll take that back and, and work it back through Michelle to get out to the members. Great. I think a lot of this is still being worked out. And I think while the details are worked out, it's important to remember that there, there is some local variation. And number two, asymptomatic, um, asymptomatic transmission still occurs. And with the vaccine, what we studied is a diagnosis of COVID-19 disease and not necessarily asymptomatic carriers of the SARS virus. So that may be where some of the quarantine recommendations um, to, to maintain quarantine after receiving the vaccine may be coming from. But I think there's gonna be more to come soon. I, mean, I would agree. I think uh, the CDC, you know, this is a dynamic situation and certainly with the new strain of COVID, uh, we actually may see some new guidances on quarantines and, and sheltering, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a lot more questions, um, so just bear with us. But um, since vaccinations have begun, will there be any issues getting the second dose of the vaccine? Uh, it is my understanding that um, you know when you go in for a vaccine, they register you. You have your name and 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 the, and the manufacturer of the dose. Uh, that there is a plan to make sure that there will be a second dose. Uh, for you, whether it's 21 days after the Pfizer, initial Pfizer uh, vaccine or 28 days after the initial Moderna vaccine. Right. That's um, actually, we just, um, some of the first uh, recipients, we had 10 pre-positioned hospitals in Ohio, and they um, just re are receiving their second doses for Pfizer this week. Um, I mean, it really, time has is flown by that folks are almost already ready for their second dose. Uh, but the federal government holds back the second dose. And so for every dose that we get shipped, we will get shipped that second dose or the booster dose, um, either three or four weeks later, depending on the product. Um, and you will receive a card. Um, there's a CDC vaccine card that you will get at the time of your first dose that will have that information on there and the reminder to come back for the second dose. Depending on the sophistication also of the, the vaccine clinic, they may have text or email reminders and, and phone call reminders to you that it's time for you to come back and get that second dose. But that's something that the clinic or the provider would uh, talk, talk you through at the time of your first dose. Um, and this question is for Lance again. Um, law enforcement are critical component, components of first responders, especially for overdoses, cardiac arrest, and vehicle accidents. These officers provide medical care to include CPR and Narcan, often prior to EMS. Can you provide an update on getting law enforcement priority in 1B for this vac vaccination? Yeah, good question. So um, law enforcement and firefighters, you know, in general, um, have not been um, prioritized yet within 1B. Um, really, the governor's talked about just the, the age group, 65 and older, education, and those with uh, critical severe illnesses. Um, but I will say, if during your scope of employment as either a firefighter or law enforcement officer, if you provide that high-risk healthcare um, interaction, uh, as part of your normal scope of work, maybe not all the time, but some of the time, 
um, we have said that those uh, individuals would be qualified under 1A. Um, I know that sometimes people fulfill dual roles within their departments. So if you're in that type of position, you would be eligible under 1A if you are in interacting with the public and other folks where you could be at, at high risk for exposure to COVID. Um, how long before the rest of the community will be vaccinated? So does ODH have kind of a time frame in place about, you know, um, when will the expectation, I guess, that, you know, all Ohioans who want the vaccine, vaccine will be vaccinated? Right. So we're working on kind of a, a statewide goal. I'm um, currently, you know, with supply constraints, it's hard to tell. Um, and it will all depend on uptake, um, how many people who are offered the vaccine actually take it and whether you can um, provide that to a backup kind of person. Um, but we're also anticipating that the additional supply that might arise from new products like AstraZeneca or Johnson & Johnson would allow us to get through um, a majority of our population you know, in this year. Um, I know HHS and CDC have talked about vaccinating the majority of uh, United States citizens by you know, the summer. Um, however, we're off to a little bit slower start as you might've seen in the news. Um, but it all depends on supply and um, the number of products available. But we will be expanding um, to include additional providers, whether it's pharmacies, federally qualified health centers, primary care providers, urgent cares. Uh, that's only a matter of time before we start expanding and, and giving broader availability and access. But it's hard to say. I mean, it could take um, some time throughout the rest of this year to get a high percentage of Ohioans vaccinated. Great. Thank you. If someone has a side effect reaction, slight fevers, chills, muscle aches following the first dose, can they expect to have a similar reaction following the second dose? That's a good question. I think it's, it's possible. I think that goes back to the immunogenic reaction that we discussed where your body's exposed to that first dose of the antigen to the vaccine and there's an immune response to that. And then with the second dose, your body is reintroduced to the antigen again. So uh, you can potentially expect to have another immunogenic reaction with those signs and symptoms that you listed. And sometimes it can be worse. And um, in the vaccines, they're, they're thinking that the second dose is probably associated with a bit more severe reaction than with the first dose. And I would agree, uh, uh, certainly for those who are participating in vaccination clinics, you should also, also always have epinephrine available for those allergic reactions. Um, having said that, the side effects, um, and I, I got my vaccine on the 23rd, um, when I look at the list of side effects, I would rather have any or all of them than to have an endotracheal tube in, in place on, on a ventilator. So everything is relative. Does it assist the state and the county you reside in to register with the V-SAFE after you receive your first vaccine? Could you repeat that question, Michelle? I might have information on it. Yep. Um, does it assist the state and the county you reside in to register with the V-SAFE after you receive your first vaccine? Well, absolutely it would assist um, the provider um, to, it's another mechanism for reminding you of your second dose. So to the extent you could use that, we would encourage it. Um, it will just be a, a fail safe kind of redundancy on making sure that that second dose is, um, you're, you're reminded of it. Okay, and this is another question for Director Himes. For smaller agencies, sending fire and EMS personnel to a central POD results in a lack of critical resources for the community. Also during H1N1, EMS received specific quantities of vaccine to vaccinate people who otherwise would not have received it, such as homeless and homebound persons. Would ODH consider relaxing the directions to health departments and allow them to give and track specific quantities of vaccine to EMS for those purposes. I 
if I understand the question, it's whether specific quantities could be allocated to EMS for homebound and homeless and other populations that then EMS would administer. Is that? Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that's what I touched on a little bit earlier is that currently um, we're asking that you be an enrolled provider. So we've got those um, protective measures in place in terms of handling, keeping it at the proper temperature, tracking and entering the data. Um, currently, we're not to the point where we're um, utilizing you know, EMS as a partner to go look at those other populations. We may expand at some point, but right now we're, we're not there and we would ask that the local health department or, or others when we get to those phases, um, you know, coordinate that. Um, but, you know, it, we'll have to see how the throughput goes and how fast we're getting it out uh, before we get to a, an expanded distribution network like that. Um, and then a couple of our um, attendees asked if you could share the guidance about um, law enforcement vaccinations under 1A, if there's something specifically that we can share with our members. I will, I know we've issued some guidance on 1A um, to hospitals and to local health departments. So I can um, shoot that around um, to you to distribute. Thank you. Um, another question, um, maybe for Dr. Cortez or Dr. Cunningham. Um, I know this is probably per individual, but at what point has the vaccine reached its peak? How long after the injection second or in, in second injection? Could you repeat that last statement? Yeah. Um, how long um, after the injection has it kind of like reached its peak for both the first um, dose and the second dose? So I guess like when does the benefits of the vaccination kind of kick in? What's the peak? Um, it, it varies by manufacturer. Um, I know after the first uh, dose of vaccine, you may have um, anywhere from 60, around 60% 60 effectiveness. And then the second dose would bring you up to the 94 to 95% effective. Yeah, this is challenging to study. What was done, for example, in the Pfizer study was they didn't necessarily measure the amount of antibodies that individuals had in their blood from the vaccine. They tested um, for COVID-19 disease. So it, it was really a pragmatic trial where um, we were testing individuals to, to see if they came down with COVID-19. Um, and there's a lot of factors that affect whether somebody is infected with SARS and then de develops disease manifestation in COVID-19, uh, both host factors as, as well as the immune system, as well as viral load and, and the exposure to the virus. So there's some variability there. I know that most of the expected uh, side effects like fever, chills, body aches, et cetera, uh, they're expecting within 72 hours. Um, and then from a scientific standpoint, you know, the, the production of antibodies takes at least that long and even longer. So it's gonna be difficult to specifically answer that question um, but when they looked at it, for example, at a week or two, uh, that's how they demonstrated the efficacy after the second dose. And we have another question. Are there any costs that my department will incur when the local health department provides our vaccinations? If so, how much? And why are we being charged when we are capable of vaccinating our own personnel? So the federal vaccine is, the vaccine itself is free. Um, we do know um, that some providers are charging an administration fee, but that should be covered by your health insurance or Medicare or Medicaid. Um, some providers are not charging an administration fee. So if anything, it would be an 18 or so dollar, I believe, is the, about the approximate amount for administration fees that are allowed but that would be billed to insurance coverage. Thank you for that. Um, I'll do a last call for questions. I'm not seeing anything else. Um, 
or any hands raised. Oh, I, actually... I believe there was one question here about convalescent plasma. Okay. I don't know if that was addressed. Got somebody raising a hand too, so one second. Um, my question is about using convalescent plasma to treat COVID patients. Currently, this plasma is donated by those who have recovered from COVID-19. Would it be possible that once someone is vaccinated, could donated plasma from a vaccinated person be used in the same capacity for treatment of COVID patients? Um, you know, I, it, it, I think it would, it would be, based on previous experience, it would be unlikely. Uh, someone who's recovered from COVID has really significantly high antibodies to COVID-19 in their system. Uh, the way the vaccine works is um, it, it'll give you, it'll stimulate your body to make antibodies, but those antibodies will not be in high concentration in your blood until you get exposed to COVID and it fights off the virus so you don't get the disease. So, so that's the difference. Um, you know, the vaccine primes your body to make antibodies if you get infected, whereas someone who is infected has a significantly high level of antibodies in their plasma. Great. And then we had somebody email in some questions um, to the group, and I think Dr. Cortez is going to try to address some of those questions. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. The, the first question is, you know, is there a benefit in receiving the vaccine if I've already had COVID-19? Dr. Cunningham, what do you think? Oh, yes, uh, they are still recommending that if you've had COVID, you should still get vaccinated. Um, however, they, uh, the current recommendations are that you defer getting the vaccine until 90 days after um, you have had it and recovered. I agree, there's definitely still benefit. After 90 days, we have the decrease in the natural antibodies produced from the infection. Uh, and there's a lot of uncertainty about long-term immunity and um, getting the vaccine would be beneficial. It would help achieve that goal after being infected. And you'll find that information in both of the training modules that we created for um, the Ohio vaccinations by EMS providers that's posted on our website. The, the other question that we were emailed was um, just asking us to touch on um, the reasons that there's allergic reactions. Is it from the vaccine? Is it from the suspension that the vaccine is, um, is stored with? Is it an allergic reaction to the products that were used to make the vaccine? Um, the, the guidance right now is that if you are allergic to any of the components of the vaccine, uh, that actually is the thing that's causing the allergic reaction. Um, the Pfizer, the components of the Pfizer are different than the components of the Moderna, but those components are also listed in our training modules. So that if someone reports that, um, you can look at the list and, and advise them to either not take the vaccine or to um, perhaps look at the other manufacturer's version and certainly if that arises in your vaccination clinic, the safest thing is to have that patient consult with their primary care physician first before administering the vaccine. Thanks, Dr. Cunningham. And the last question was whether if you receive a vaccine, can you still spread the virus? And I think we touched on this a few minutes ago, uh, but I think the consensus right now is, is it's still possible potentially to spread the virus even if you've received the vaccine. And we discussed that with the current quarantine recommendations. And, 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 I, and I, we talk about spreading viruses, we all think about the respiratory spread, but realize this is a hardy virus. So even if it's on a surface or on your clothes, if you've been vaccinated um, and been around someone who is, who is shedding the virus, um, you may not get infected, but you can infect others just from touching surfaces. Okay, we do have a couple more questions. Um, uh, Jeff Klein um, is going to go ahead and ask his question. Jeff, I think you're unmuted. Okay. 
maybe. Okay, well, should an immunocompromised person, such as somebody with lupus or HIV, receive the vaccine? Um, uh, they should do so in consultation with their doctor based on what type of medications and what type of exacerbation they have um, in their illness. Uh, the challenge is that immunocompromised uh, folks may not be able to mount the same level of immunity if receiving the vaccine, uh, which is why you need to engage with their primary care physician to advise them best on whether they should take it and also when they should take it. Um, you know, for example, uh, with lupus, sometimes you might be on a, on a steroid burst. Well, that's not the time to get a vaccine because steroids, uh, uh, knock down your body's ability to, to make the um, antibodies and, and things that would fight off, of the, fight off the disease. So it really is going to be an individual thing. But, um, you know, at this point, those are the, the cautions that are available for immunocompromised patients, uh, which is also listed in our training module. I agree with Dr. Cunningham. The decision to make the vaccine, it's about a risk benefit, you know, Am, am I willing to accept some of the risks to, to gain the benefit? And for most individuals with chronic medical conditions, the benefits are gonna outweigh the risk, but with, immunosu with immunosuppression, uh, that risk benefit analysis gets really complicated. And I agree that should be done in consultation with your primary care physician and your specialist. Lance, do you know if BWC is going to provide coverage for an employee that has a serious reaction to the vaccination that requires medical care? Um, let me ask that question um, of, actually, I'll start with Director McLeod and she can wrap it to BWC. Um, I assume they would, but let me confirm that. Great question. And we'll get that answer out to everyone. Thank you. Last call for questions. Okay. Well, thank you so much, um, Dr. Cunningham, Dr. Cortez, uh, Deputy Director Himes. We really appreciate um, you participating on this with us today. Um, I know that we have a couple follow-ups and we will work together to get that information out to all the attendees. And then we will also um, uh, get this information out to everyone that was not able to attend as well. So if you have um, any additional questions that weren't answered, if we missed anything, feel free to send me an email and we'll try to get everything answered and pushed out to um, everyone. So again, just appreciate your time today and I hope everyone has a great new year. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks. Thank you. Stay safe out there.